This is Nathaniel Jones, and I'm presenting work that I did along with Ali Irani, Andre Pina, Katie Gertz, and Nelson Suarez for 4.433 Modeling Urban Energy Flows. This is entitled Al Qadsiya, Kuwait City, Sustainable Urban Retrofit and Design. This work demonstrates tools developed here at the MIT Sustainable Design Lab for neighborhood level urban design and applies them to the Al Qadsiya neighborhood in Kuwait. Kuwait is experiencing rapid population growth. The current population is one and a quarter million citizens and additionally more than two million resident non-citizens. The government provides housing to all families. There is currently a waiting list of 110,000 families for housing and this list is growing by 8,000 families per year. In part in order to accommodate this, the government plans to create five new cities within the next 10 years. This also requires an increase in the electricity production capacity in order to meet the needs of a growing population. To address the issue of growth and energy demand, we are working with the Kuwait MIT Center for Natural Resources and the Environment. The center was established in 2005 and brings together faculty, students, and scientists to improve scientific and technical understanding of natural resources and environmental challenges. In 2013, the center established a signature project titled Sustainability of Kuwait's Built Environment, funded by the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences, which partners MIT, including the MIT Sustainable Design Lab, with the Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research and Kuwait University. Our work is related to task C of this project, energy, and fulfills parts of three project goals. To model a mixed-use neighborhood with UMI, the urban modeling interface developed here at MIT, to create detailed templates for typical buildings, and to estimate construction material quantities in those buildings. In designing for Kuwait, we must consider the climate. Temperatures are hot, especially in the summer months, June, July, and August. In other months, outdoor temperatures fall within the comfort band for at least part of each day. Winds are typically out of the northwest, passing over the Gulf and the Central Business District. The growth of Kuwait City can be seen in the formation of ring roads around the Central Business District. We focus on Al Qadsiya, the neighborhood outlined in red. It consists of one central service core and eight residential blocks surrounding it. We focus in particular on Block 8, outlined in gold. The neighborhood is near the Central Business District less than two kilometers away, in fact. But because of the busy roads surrounding it, it's accessible only by car. Zooming in on Block 8, we see that the block consists of a number of smaller residential blocks and service elements, including a park, youth center, mosque, and cooperative store. Housing is built in varying densities, ranging from high density to medium density, and low density along the ring road. In all, this block contains 200 villas, which accounts for a population of over 2,000 residents. In March, a group of MIT students visited Al Qadsiya along with our Kuwaiti research partners. We cataloged the buildings in Block 8, including photographing them and taking notes on their construction. We identified four housing typologies within the neighborhood. The first are government-issued villas built for limited-income families. These buildings abut their neighbors and in some cases include internal courtyards. Some of these structures have been retrofitted, and this is our second typology. These renovations tend to be cosmetic and are generally evident in the facades of the buildings. In other cases, original government-built villas have been replaced by newer detached structures. This is our third category. Our final typology is the large private villas generally built around the edges of the neighborhood. These villas are detached structures with widely varied appearance, generally built privately with government loans. Based on our visit, we developed two goals, one to provide comfort and two to increase density. At first, these two goals appear to be conflicting. However, we can meet both of them by promoting walkability within the neighborhood. In order to promote walkability, we also need to design to improve outdoor comfort. This in turn requires that we consider the daylight performance of the neighborhood. 
And finally, we also consider energy intensity use. We developed three building typologies which serve as possible design interventions for the neighborhood. The first two, which we term detached and overhang typologies, are three-story buildings that maintain the current density of 1.4 floor area ratio. The third, the high-rise typology, has a floor area ratio four times greater and represents a method to increase density in the neighborhood. Our model consists of two blocks of the Alcatsi neighborhood, Block 8 and the Central Service Corps, Block 5. For our walkability analysis, we consider this entire model. However, for most of the other analyses, we consider a small portion of Block 8 and repeat this to create an urban fabric for analysis. Our method integrates Rhinoceros, a CAD tool, with three programs developed here at the MIT Sustainable Design Lab, the Template Editor, the Urban Daylighting Tool, and UMI, the Urban Modeling Interface. We model the neighborhood geometry in Rhino and use the Template Editor to input building construction information, occupancy schedules, and other data gained on our site visit. The Urban Daylighting Tool performs outdoor comfort and daylight autonomy simulation. OMI performs walkability analysis and energy simulation. We measure walkability using the 2011 version of the WalkScore metric as published on WalkScore.com in a white paper in the fall of 2011. Walk scores range from 0, which is bad, to 100, which is good, based on proximity to services and amenities within the neighborhood. A walk score can be calculated for each building by determining paths to various amenities that surround it. The walk score for the neighborhood as is is quite good when judged by an 800 meter walkable radius, which is typical for the United States. However, based on the climate in Kuwait, we determined that we should use a 200 meter walkable radius, which is similar to the building guidelines in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. As can be seen, the walk scores with the 200 meter radius are much worse. In fact, very few of the amenities are reachable from the residential buildings. Adding crosswalks over the main road within the neighborhood helps to improve the reachability of the amenities. In our design intervention, we further improve walkability by adding paths and small parks within each of the small blocks in block 8. To reflect our high-rise typology, we also experiment with increasing the density of the neighborhood and quadrupling the number of amenities in the residential blocks. These plots show the range of walk scores found within each neighborhood in each case that we tested. As can be seen, the best walk scores are created with a high-density neighborhood that includes crosswalks over the busy roads. Outdoor comfort is determined by the number of hours over which temperature and solar radiation work together to produce comfortable conditions. We characterize places with few overheating hours as comfortable. Areas that frequently experience overheating are shown in red. The neighborhood as built and our type 1 intervention both tend to experience very warm streets, although some courtyards are kept cool throughout the day. Our type 2 overhang typology keeps the streets comfortable because of its overhangs, however the courtyards can sometimes overheat. The type 3 typology, the high-rises, are cool throughout the day because of the shadows that they cast. However, our model does not consider the effect of urban heat islands, which can be produced by street canyons. Here we show the maximum and mean number of overheating and overcooling hours in each design. As can be seen, the high-rise typology produces the most comfortable conditions with the fewest number of overheating and overcooling hours. The overhang typology also produces better results than what is currently built. Daylight autonomy represents the fraction of hours over which a point in space is illuminated above a target level, in this case 300 lux. We characterize spaces on a range from dim, shown in blue, to bright, shown in red, based on average daylight autonomy on each floor. 
The neighborhood as built has highly variable daylight autonomy as a result of varying window sizes and self-shading. The detached typology, type 1, has good daylight autonomy as a result of the space between structures. The overhang typology, type 2, has good daylight autonomy on the upper floors, however the lower floors experience shading. The type 3, high-rise typology, experiences significant self-shading and has limited views to the sky from the lower floors, resulting in poor daylight autonomy. In this chart, we show average daylight autonomy for the entire neighborhood using each building typology. The best daylight autonomies are achieved with the detached and overhang typologies. The high-rise typology experiences the worst daylight autonomy. In order to perform energy analysis, we must first define templates that represent building constructions and occupancy schedules. We define four building templates, three representing current buildings within the neighborhood, and the fourth representing contemporary construction practices. The first template, which we call original, represents government-issued villas. These buildings have poor construction, no insulation, and typically single-pane glazing. The second template, retrofit, represents buildings for which improvements have been made since their original construction. Often these improvements are cosmetic, but they do include changes to the facades and often include double-pane glazing. The third template, which we call modern, represents privately built construction, which is often more recent. This construction often includes double-pane glazing and insulation. The final template, which we call revised, is based on the 2010 building code. This template is not yet applied to buildings within the neighborhood. It features increased insulation and coated windows. We created five energy models. The first represents the neighborhood as built, with templates assigned according to our observations. The other four use the revised template to represent the neighborhood as it would be constructed if it were built today. These models represent the neighborhood with geometry as it is and with our three proposed interventions. On the left, we show the annual operational energy use for the neighborhood with each proposed intervention. The revised template provides better performance than the neighborhood as built, and the best performance is achieved with the high-rise typology, type 3. On the right, we show the embodied energy per year based on an expected 50-year life cycle for the neighborhood. The lowest embodied energy is achieved with the detached type 1 and high-rise type 3 typologies because of their reduced surface areas. We summarize our results in the form of a scorecard. We show energy use intensity, walk score, outdoor thermal comfort, daylight autonomy, and embodied energy for the neighborhood as built and our three proposed interventions. The high-rise typology, type 3, outperforms the others in terms of energy use intensity, walk score, outdoor comfort, and embodied energy. However, better daylight autonomy is achieved with the detached and overhang typologies, types 1 and 2. These proposals with lower floor area ratios might also be said to provide more desirable living spaces. This demonstrates the trade-off between our goals of comfort and density. This is an important point to consider in future investigations.